name is Jane Kirtley. I'm the Scylla Professor of Media Ethics and Law and the director of the Scylla Center at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Minnesota. And it's my privilege to welcome you tonight to our 30th annual Scylla Lecturer. Uh, many of you have been to earlier lectures, and I'm delighted that you've come back. If this is your first Scylla lecture, I hope you'll find it interesting, informative, and provocative. Before we get to the formal part of the lecture, I want to take a quick moment to acknowledge the fact that the Scylla Center and the Scylla Lecture Series itself exist only because of the generous endowment created by the late Otto Scylla and his wife, Helen. Helen is here tonight, and please join me in thanking her. Now, as I said, this is the 30th annual Scylla Lecture, and we've had a lot of very interesting lecturers over the years. I could not begin to name them all. If you were able to pick up one of the programs, you've got a list in reverse chronological order. But I just want to mention that we've had a handful of journalists and numerous lawyers over the years. Uh, some of our lawyers have included James Goodale, who was counsel to the New York Times during the Pentagon Papers case, Floyd Abrams, a uh, very prominent First Amendment lawyer, Mark Stevens, who was counsel to Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, Lee Levine, who argued the Bartnicki versus Vopper wiretap case in the US Supreme Court, and many others. A constant, though not annual, theme that we've had in our lectures, at least since 9-11, has involved striking the balance between government transparency, freedom of the press, the right of the public to know, and national security. And all of those issues are brought together in almost a perfect storm tonight in our conversation with Jim Risen, who is twice a Pulitzer Prize winner for his work covering national security for the New York Times, and his attorney, Joel Kurtzberg, who's a partner at Cahill Gordon in New York, who represented Jim in his battle to resist government efforts to disclose the identity of his confidential sources. Some of the questions that we'll be pondering, in addition to a resume of Jim's long journey of defiance, I think he would use that word, should the press publish classified information, especially when the government claims that doing so will damage its efforts to protect the public? Would this be the act of an independent government watchdog, or one that is needlessly endangering public health and safety? Should journalists support the government and supply the public only with information the government thinks is appropriate? Or should the press be the government's watchdog, searching out and reporting on abuses of power? Should the press be an advocate? Should it champion causes? Should it take political positions? Or should it be objective and nonpartisan? Should it respect and reflect social institutions and traditions? Or should it challenge them? These are some of the questions we've explored in many of our lectures over the years, and we'll continue to disclose, discuss them to this evening. So with that, I'm going to join uh, Joel and Jim here on the platform, and we're going to start our conversation. So please join me in welcoming Jim Risen and Joel Kripke. It was not really my intent to be the moderator this evening, but as we learned earlier this evening, Joel and Jim have had lots of interesting conversations about this subject over the years, but guess what? We've never been privy to them before. So tonight you're going to hear some discussions uh, and some disagreements, I think, that they've had about some of the issues that arose. And where I'd like to start, for the benefit of the people in the audience who may not know your whole story, Jim, is if you would give us a brief resume of what brought you to your confrontation with the government. <laughs> OK, well, thanks for having me. Um, like you said, this is the first time uh, Joel and I have uh, spoken publicly together. So I'm really looking forward to is it. Is your mic on? I think so. It's on, yeah. OK, good. Uh, and, um, you know, basically, I was, I've was i been a reporter at the New York Times for 17 years, I think. Uh, and I covered, uh, I've covered intelligence and national security for many years. And then now I just do projects, kind of uh, more enterprise type stories. Uh, and um, in the way this whole thing started <laughs> was uh, in 2006, I wrote a book called State of War. Uh, in which I included a, um, 
a chapter in the book. The book was about the Bush administration and uh, the CIA and intelligence and the war in Iraq and the larger global war on terror. And I had a, a chapter in the book about a failed CIA operation in Iran that had gone, uh, been mismanaged and botched. And um, the book came out right after I also uh, wrote a story in the New York Times about the NSA and the Bush administration's domestic spying operations. And the, so the Bush administration began two separate leak investigations, one of the chapter in my book and then one about the story in the New York Times on the NSA. And uh, eventually they dropped the investigation of the NSA story in the New York Times, but they continued the investigation of my book. And in um, 2008, they subpoenaed me to testify in a grand jury. Uh, they wanted me to reveal my sources for the chapter, and I refused. And um, I uh, fought a whole series of subpoenas over the next, since the, ever since then, until early this year. And um, Joel represented me throughout that entire time. So. Well, again, for the benefit of some people who may not be as, you know, attuned to the law, um, this grand jury investigation uh, into the leaks would have been intended to do what? Who, who was it seeking to indict and for what? Do you know? Well, they wanted to find out who my sources were who it, uh, about the chapter in my book. Okay. They had started, as I said, they'd also started a separate leak investigation into stories uh, I did with Eric Lischblau at the New York Times about NSA domestic surveillance operations. I also know that they did uh, they investigated several other chapters in my book. They had, the FBI was talking, was questioning people who they thought might be sources for other, uh, several, two or three other chapters in my book. And so I've always believed uh, that what really happened in this case was they got very angry at me for our story in the New York Times about the NSA a domestic spying program that came out in 2005. But that the government, the Bush administration, decided they didn't want a full-blown constitutional showdown with the New York Times. And so they came after something else in my book. And I think they were trying to isolate me, come after me separate from coming after the New York Times. And so they found something in my book to conduct a leak investigation. That's my view of what happened. So. But you were not seen as a target of the grand jury investigation. Is that right? Or well, not? at first, you should ask Joel about it. Okay, this. I'll ask Joel. We, we got a very different response when we asked both. Of, this case went on for so long, there were multiple administrations. But at the outset, when the Bush administration was running the show, we asked them point blank. We said, uh, can you just confirm for us that Jim is neither a subject nor a target of the investigation. And we were expecting the answer to come back, of course, no, he's not. Um, and it did not come back, no, he's not. They said, we cannot confirm that he is not a subject or target of the investigation. We got a very different answer when we dealt with the Obama administration. They said right away, he's not a subject or target, and we can tell you that. But, but for years, we went on with uh, the answer, we cannot assure you that he is not a subject or target. And if he had been a subject or target, what would the charge have been? Well, presumably they would have charged him under the Espionage Act, and that's a very big problem for reporters. Um, the, the statute uh, has been in place for many, many years. It has uh, never been used to prosecute a journalist for reporting confidential information. And while the legislative history suggests that it was never intended to allow for such a prosecution, the language of the statute is so vague and, and ambiguous um, that it really could be read to allow for such a prosecution. And there have been threats made to prosecute. In fact, in this case, we cited threats made by the Attorney General on TV, not that they were going to prosecute Jim, but that they were actively, you know, they said it in such a way where it was clearly a threat. They were contemplating whether or not the law was violated and that their job was to determine whether or not 
the law was violated when a journalist discloses this type of information. So they were, they were not hiding the fact. They were very much taking advantage of the ambiguity in the law and making a threat that they might prosecute Jim under the Espionage Act. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get that on the table for everybody because I think, you know, the, the heart of Jim's story that most people have followed is, is his battle against the subpoenas. But I want to underscore that the issue of whether a journalist could be criminally prosecuted under the espionage statute for publishing classified information or even possessing it for that matter um, is, as Joel suggests, not a solved question. We really don't know because the law is written in, in, I think, deliberately vague language, but it leaves us open with the question of whether a journalist could actually be uh, subject to that kind of prosecution at some point in the future. Well, you know, the other issue related to that was at first they, they wanted, uh, they demanded, before they subpoenaed me, they issued a letter to, uh, to me demanding all kinds of cooperation. And one of the things they wanted were all documents and notes that um, I might have related to my reporting. And when my lawyers uh, told them I didn't have them, uh, they threatened me, they, they made a uh, not too veiled threat of uh, charging me with obstruction of justice also for refusing to turn over the notes. Was there any threat of a search warrant at any point or was it all done through subpoenas? No, there was no threat of a search warrant. And even before the subpoena issued, we had had negotiations. So while in, in January of 07, really, we started with the subpoena, we actually had been negotiating with them back into 2006 because under the DOJ guidelines, the Justice Department can't issue a subpoena to a journalist without engaging in good faith negotiations about the First Amendment issues that are implicated. So we had been talking to them about it, and there was not a threat of a search warrant. Okay. I'm going to ask a, a Brian Lamb C-SPAN question for the benefit of the audience that is not non is, are non lawyers. What are we talking about when we're talking about a subpoena? What exactly is that? So a subpoena in this case is a request for uh, a potential witness to provide either testimony or documents that are relevant in this case to a criminal investigation. So there's a grand jury investigation trying to determine whether or not someone has broken the law. And the grand jury has the power to compel someone by the power of the court, with the power of the court behind them, to provide either relevant testimony or documents. And if the person refuses, they can be subject to the powers of the court and be held in contempt for not, for not following the subpoena. And it's worth reminding ourselves that grand juries meet in secret. So if a journalist like Jim were to go in to testify before a grand jury, there would be no publicly available record, at least not officially. There might be leaks about what happened in the grand jury. But it would not be like a trial where somebody could come and observe Jim on the stand and hear whether he revealed who his source was or not. Once he went inside the grand jury room and the door would be closed, there would be no way for the public to know what transpired there, unless, of course, if he was found in contempt and then you'd assume he hadn't testified. Well, he would be free to talk about it after if he wanted to. Right. There would be nothing that would, it is secret, but the witness, him or herself, is free to speak afterwards. So he could hold a press conference after if he felt like it was important and say, this is what I just told the grand jury. But most people, for obvious reasons, don't do that. The, the interesting thing in our case, the real dynamic that took hold and, and really made this case last so long was that the district judge in this case, who heard the case in Virginia, a federal judge in Virginia, was very sympathetic to my case and kept quashing the government's subpoenas. And so we kept thinking that at some point the government was going to get the message that the judge was opposed to what they were doing. But they kept coming back. And that was the, the thing that really shocked me the most, especially about the Obama <coughs> administration. The Obama administration kept issuing new subpoenas to me. The judge would quash them, and then they would issue a new one. And then they would, and when it finally got to the trial and they, she quashed the final trial subpoena after the grand juries, the government s appealed that to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and put the trial on hold for almost three years just to try to get me to force me to testify. And I 
could never understand the Obama administration's obsession with this issue. So we have a, a slightly different perspective on it. I mean, I, I agree with you and, and was very disappointed with the new administration. We really were hopeful that they would, they would drop the matter, which they have complete discretion to do. But there was a, a very big difference in the tone of both administrations in the handling of this case. With the Bush administration, they were, had almost zero concern about the First Amendment implications, in my view. They said, we want them to testify. They had, a, we got an order that quashed the subpoena in part, but it originally required him to give some very limited testimony, and it was, we moved for reconsideration, and the Bush administration said, we want you on the stand tomorrow, even before the issue could be heard, and, and the judge was furious, and she stayed the case and then allowed us to, to continue. The Obama administration was very different. The Bush administration said, he's not a, we can't tell you he's not a subject or target. The Obama administration tried very hard to accommodate First Amendment interests, but in the end, they didn't. They, they said, well, he's not a subject or target, and well, we're not going to ask him to tell us who his source is. We're going to have uh, uh, pseudonyms. So we just want him to get on the stand and say, tell us source A, when did you meet with the person? And where did you meet? And what time did you speak to them? And what was said? But don't tell us the name of the person. And you know, in essence, they were asking for so many details that it was obvious who the person would be. But at least their, their attitude was that they were trying, even in a, in a very feeble way, to, to make an effort to accommodate the See, First Amendment. This interests. is what Joel and I have argued about for years privately, is that to me, the Obama administration, the bottom line, they're no different from the Bush administration when it comes to the war on terror and national security. The only difference is that they feel bad about it. <laughs> But that is, that is where we, we beg to differ. And, and to me, by the way, this isn't about which administration is in power, because and I'll get to in a second. I think regardless of who's in power, this issue is going to be coming up again and again. And both administrations will be going after journalists for, for reasons that I, I can get into as, as the discussion progresses. But I will say this. At the end of the day, say what you want about the Obama administration, and they could have and should have backed off much earlier. They had the, the ability to do that. They did back off at the very end. Yeah, but they did not is, call on, on, on you to testify. Now you attorney and, privilege and, and, like. and, <laughs> and I don't have any doubt, given the tone of, of what took place with the other administration, that had they been there, they would have said, get on the stand, we don't care. But the fundamental hypocrisy of the Obama administration on this issue, that was, it was, I, it, well, it was, they would constantly try to convince you that their heart was in the right place, <laughs> even though they were trying to throw me in jail. But they didn't persuade me of that. I didn't care about where their heart was. I mean, at the end of the day, their actions counted a lot more than their words. And they didn't do the right thing for years and years and years. And they didn't handle it well. And I'm not, a def I'm not someone who's going to defend <laughs> how this was handled by any, either administration in the government, because I think it was handled very poorly all around. Right. But I do think that it mattered in the end, notwithstanding how they handled it very poorly, they did do the right thing at the very, very end. And they didn't, you know, I don't care what their reasons are. They did it because there was a lot of pressure and right. they didn't really feel like they had a choice. But I'm not so sure that, that it would have mattered to the, the other but administration. The bottom, but the bottom line consequences of what the Obama administration did on this case versus what the Bush administration is much worse. Because what the Obama administration did was they, when the judge, in my case, quashed the subpoena from the Obama administration, they took it to the appeals court and they wrote a mo they filed a brief saying, we don't yes. think that the reporter's privilege exists in criminal, federal criminal law. We want you, the appeals court, to strike down any last remnant, legal remnant, of the existence of a reporter's privilege. Right. And they did that. They got this, the court to do that. Yes. The Supreme Court refused to overturn that. Right. And that's now their bottom line. The a legacy of Barack Obama and Eric Holder on f press freedom issues is to say that reporters have no right to protect their sources. And, and I agree with that, although I would add that I think that it was 
really a freak of, of uh, circumstances that they ended up bringing that appeal in the first place, right? So, so the reason that appeal got brought, um, the subpoena got quashed. We were successful at the trial level. Um, and we were in court on th uh, Thursday before a, a Monday trial date. And the judge said to the parties, I want to know right now if I'm trying this case on Monday. Is there any chance that you guys are going to settle this case or that we're not going forward on Monday? And the government attorney stood up and said, Judge, there is no way we are going to trial on Monday. I went up to the government lawyer after and I said, well, I guess if you're going to trial on Monday, you're not appealing this ruling about Jim. And they said, that's absolutely right. We are not appealing. And I believe he meant it. On Friday, before the Monday, the very next day, there was a closed court hearing. And I don't know what took place in that closed court hearing, but I do know there were two orders that issued that precluded the government from putting certain witnesses on the stand that they felt were essential to their case. And they decided that they had to appeal based on that ruling on Friday, that they couldn't get in these witnesses that were essential to their case. And they figured, well, in for a dime, in for a dozen. If we're going up on appeal on this other issue, we might as well appeal the issue with Jim. Now, they didn't have to do that. And they shouldn't have done that, 100%. But I believe they meant it at that moment in time when they looked the judge in the eye and said, we're going forward on Monday. I don't think they intended to appeal your order. I think that, that it's just historically, it could have very easily gone a very different way had those other, other unrelated orders not issued on, on Friday. And that's not something that, that we've discussed publicly before. Yeah, no. Now you're, this is what Joel and I have talked about for years <laughs> between us. So. You, you alluded to the issue of, of uh, pressure uh, coming uh, from a variety of, of sides pr throughout the, the life of this case. And I'd be curious to know what the two of you thought of um, both uh, the media coverage of this case, um, the support that came from the media in terms of your actual litigation uh, in the case, because my sense was that this was not a situation where the news media were united in support of you. Right, no, that's right. Well, and also, um, I think for the first few years, until really the last six months or a year of the case, we got very little attention uh, in the press. We, the newspaper, the major newspapers would write short stories about the case whenever some major issue happened, like when a new subpoena was issued or some major court ruling would come out, like when the Fourth Circuit ruled. Um, but that was really limited to, you know, oh, the New York Times or a couple other newspapers would write about it. Um, it was not really until the case went to the Supreme Court uh, and uh, that it really started to get a lot more attention. And I think partly that was um, kind of the hook that reporters you know, naturally look for. Oh, it's a Supreme Court case, potentially. Uh, I know how newspapers think that's, or, or news organizations think that, oh, Supreme Court case, yeah, let's write about it. Uh, and so I think that had a big effect. Even though we lost at the Supreme Court level, I think ultimately that played a big role in the, in the news coverage. And then the news coverage of the last few months led to so a kind of a groundswell of support. I, uh, one group um, began a petition drive on my behalf and got, I think, over 100,000 signatures that they delivered in order to get a photo op. They delivered physically to the Justice Department, telling them to drop the case. And so, you know, things like that began to get more attention. But from, from the lawyer's side, though, um, because I remember in my former life doing a lot of friend of the court briefs in support of cases like Jim's, uh, were you getting that kind of support from the media? In the beginning of the case, we didn't get a lot of support at all. I, I remember a lot of meetings with media lawyers where people would very vocally get up, and I'm not going to say who they were representing or whatnot, and said, we don't want to make an issue of this case. We think that there's, there are national security issues and implications, and, and it might be a bad fact pattern on which to, 
to test this out and we should wait for a better fact pattern and and you know that changed over time we got more support as time went on but even at the very end when we filed our petition for certiorari with the US Supreme Court there were a number of news organizations that were arguing and were hesitant to support support the cause um, because they thought let's wait for a better fact pattern of course we don't have the luxury of waiting for a, a better fact pattern and I think this was a very compelling fact pattern. If, if we can't defend our journalists when they are writing about issues of national security, about issues that, that really matter to the public, um, then, then what are we fighting for in the first place? You know, I, I remember when Joel would tell me about how the, there was so much reluctance among the legal profession. I, I kept saying, you know, that what they don't understand is virtually every leak investigation is going to be about national security. They don't do leak investigations of coverage of HUD. I mean, nobody cares. So, uh, you know, that's what the cases are all going to be like. And every new, you know, every story about national security is going to be complicated and convoluted because it's so difficult to get the information. So. And, of course, when you were filing all these motions to quash the subpoena, you were arguing constitutionally based privilege as, as the basis for um, striking down the subpoena or was it what, what, what were you arguing? We had multiple arguments and, and one was uh, a, a privilege under the First Amendment. Um, the law on that is uh, very uncertain. There is a, a Supreme Court case in 1972 uh, called Brandsburg. It was a 5-4 decision but nobody really knows what it means. The, one of the five basically wrote a separate opinion that a lot of people read as being contrary to what the five said. So it's sort of like four, four and a half. People don't really know what, what it means. And the appellate courts have been all over the place. But in addition to that, we argued that, that there's a, a privilege under the common law. Even if you don't recognize a privilege under the First Amendment, there's an almost near unanimity among the states every single state that has considered the issue, uh, and it's all but one, Wyoming, has not voted either way on this, but every other state and the District of Columbia recognizes some form of protection for confidential sources for journalists. And it's crazy for federal courts not to recognize some form of protection when there's that level of unanimity. And about 40 of the states also have statutory shield laws. Minnesota is one of those states. Correct. It's called the Free Flow of Information Act here in Minnesota. But there is no federal shield law. And the initiative to try to get a federal shield law passed was going on in the backdrop as your case was going forward. And plus, it's also very easy if prosecutors want to turn, these, turn almost any story into a federal case. Uh, and so they literally they, yeah, they can, yeah it's very easy for if they want to avoid a shield law in a case involving journalism there's a lot of ways that they can take it to federal court rather than a state court and avoid the state shield laws so what about the federal shield law initiatives how I, th this was a, an example I think again where the news media were not necessarily presenting a united front but even to the extent that they did, there was a lot of trouble getting Congress's attention. And a sticking point was exactly the one you were talking about, Joel, which was the national security concern, right? Yeah, so there, there have been shield laws proposed and many proposed in recent years. None of them have passed. Uh, we were hopeful as Jim's case was being litigated. In fact, it probably was the, the closest we've come. <laughs> I've been involved actually for many years in the, the efforts to get one passed. But we were hopeful that, that finally the administration, in the past, the administrations had actively opposed a shield law. The administration here, at least in name, <laughs> came out and said they favored the passage of a shield law. And there was some bipartisan support. But um, the devil is in the details as to what kind of protection you're going to get. And as soon as you start to say you want a shield law, people say, well, we want to debate who's covered, who's a journalist. Is, is any blogger sitting in their underwear is what they always say. It was actually what they said at oral argument in the Judy Miller case. Any blogger in their underwear is always brought up. Uh, can they decide to put up a blog that night. Are they a journalist? I mean, who's a journalist? So they start debating about that. 
and they say, well, there should be a, a loophole of some sort for national security or threats to national security because they invoke WikiLeaks and the problems that have arisen where people have disclosed a tremendous number of national secrets uh, that many believe are a threat to our nation's national security. And of course, it depends on, on what the, the scope of those exceptions are to determine whether or not the shield law is worth having or not. Um, this one, the latest one, never really got all the way through. There were different versions, one in the Senate, one in the House. One was more protective than others. They both had national security loopholes, but one was a lot smaller than, than the other. Um, and uh, my view is that the, the best way to cut through all of the red tape is to have a very simple bill. Right, right now, there is, uh, as I alluded to before, there are guidelines for the DOJ. They can't issue a subpoena in any kind of case unless they do a certain type of balancing that takes into account First Amendment interests. And it applies regardless of national security, and it applies regardless of whether it's a grand jury investigation, a criminal trial, or a civil case, except the guidelines say on their face that they are not enforceable by any third party. It's not enforceable in a court. It's just up to the government to say, oh, well, we complied with our guidelines, and if you don't think we did, you have no recourse. My bill would be very simple. It would say, let's give third parties recourse to enforce what these people say they're doing already. And we don't have to fight about any definitions of who's a journalist. They already presumably do some analysis of their own about those questions. They, they already have to resolve those questions. It's a very simple bill. Let third parties, and therefore let courts be an independent judge about whether those guidelines are being complied with, rather than just letting the government unilaterally say that they're complying with those types of guidelines. The experience in many states when they have enacted shield laws is that oftentimes there's a catalyst involving a journalist within that state who uh, ran afoul of the law, becomes, for lack of a better term, a First Amendment martyr. The public rallies to that and says, this is not acceptable in our state. We're not going to have uh, this kind of thing happening to reporters. We don't like the idea of reporters going to jail for doing their jobs. Do you think you're that First Amendment martyr, or could you have been for this case? Well, I didn't go to jail, so it doesn't count. Right. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's what it's going to take at the federal level, is some more journalists to face what I did and actually face it more, go further, and actually have to spend a lot of time in jail. Uh, I would. Joel and I disagree on one aspect of the shield law and its potential unintended consequences. I think that any national security loophole is dangerous because I know how the government works and I know what they'll do is they'll reverse engineer that as soon as possible. The first thing that the CIA and the NSA and the Justice Department and the FBI will do, well, they'll, they'll take that national security loophole and turn it on its head and they'll say, this is now the, when we decide what, is, uh, what stories can be, conduct, where, where we can conduct a leak investigation on, under this loophole, that is the limit. That is now the acceptable limit of journalism in America. In other words, they will take that loophole and say, because we are now in the federal government setting up a system where we decide what is acceptable journalism and what is not be, by deciding which stories we can go conduct leak investigations of and which we can't, we are now in the business as a federal government of setting parameters on national security journalism and deciding what stories are good and what stories aren't. And you're giving the federal government the power to decide which, you know, what things are outside, so far outside the mainstream that we will prosecute and criminalize that journalism. That's what I'm afraid of by the shield, by the shield law proposals that have been, been put forward. Any kind of system in which you give some government body the power to decide what is acceptable journalism and what is not, I think erodes the First Amendment. 
And just to be clear, because you said we don't agree on this point, we do agree on this point. I mean, I, I don't think, I don't want a national security loophole. Right. I, I would be in favor of a, a shield law without such a loophole. Right. But the problem is getting one through, well, getting any through, through Congress <laughs> at this point is virtually impossible. But to yeah. get the, this 9-11 mindset that has stayed in place really makes national security the trump card in Congress. And you know, we were talking about the support that you had and didn't have. The idea that there is a constituency out there other than journalists that would like to see this shield law passed, I, I don't think most members of Congress believe that that exists. And if they're going to expend political capital, why should they do it for journalists who don't like them anyway, in right. their in right. their view? Seriously. And I think this is a real obstacle. The, the notion of you know members of Congress who would, I'm talking about a critical mass that you could actually pass it. There's certainly individual members. But enough people who would believe that this is necessary to have in a country that considers itself a republic and a democracy, which is very common in Europe, for example. Um, European uh, countries, for the most part, would protect somebody like Jim Rison in the kind of reporting he does. And it's one example of where we in the United States sort of lag behind that uh, because there's this refusal to recognize that there should be a privilege. But I wanted to come back to something that you were saying about the government sort of deciding what's appropriate for you to report on. But another way to look at this question from another angle would be to say, well, who are you or who is the press to decide what the public should know? Doesn't the government know best whether things need to be classified and whether real harm is going to result if you report them? Who elected you to make those decisions? Nobody elected me, uh, but it, there is a First Amendment that says the freedom of the press in the United States will not be infringed. And I am a First Amendment purist. I believe that they really meant that when they said that. Uh, the power of newspapers in our society has always been uh, as an outside check on governmental power. And I think that is, uh, you've seen that today where there's very little congressional oversight left. There's virtually no um, no check, no other check on the growth in the national security state, the growth of the global war on terror, uh, other than the press. The press has basically, if you look back at since the time since 9-11, which is the longest continuous period of war in American history, even though most people don't even realize we're still at war, there's been virtually everything we now know about the global war on terror was first disclosed in the press or by the media. There's been virtually no congressional oversight to speak of that has uh, really done a good job of bringing to light things that the American people need to know. All of the subjects that we now debate as, in, as commonplace knowledge are things that were, were classified. The entire global war on terror is the first war in American history that's an entirely classified war. The only way anybody knows what the United States is doing around the world is because of the press. And if we had, and we've had to fight the government tooth and nail at every point to get those stories out. One of my favorite examples is in 2001, Cy Hirsch wrote a story revealing the existence of an armed drone the Predator drone with a Hellfire missile had been used in Afghanistan uh, to kill uh, an Al-Qaeda leader. At that time, that was in, the entire existence of the drone was, was classified. Now, you know, the government can't wait every, every five minutes to tell you how great drones are. But until it was first disclosed in, by, in the New Yorker, it was classified. And so we've had to fight in two, you know, uh, one inch by one inch all the way through for the last 14 years to try to tell the American people what's going on around the world in their name. And the government has fought us at every step. And let me, I just want to add a, a couple quick things to that. Part of the problem is we, we need the press as a check on the government because there is a tremendous problem with the government over-classifying things 
as being top secret or secret when they really are just embarrassed or believe that they would be humiliated or there's been government wrongdoing. There are so many instances where if you look at things that have been classified, there's a tremendous percentage of it that really isn't or shouldn't be classified. And there is no check on the government at all in that regard, um, except for the press. The congressional oversight is totally dysfunctional now. And that is what, you know, when Hillary Clinton or somebody talks about, oh, Edward Snowden should have done it differently, or somebody should have done it differently, or we, you know, we, we can't have these leaks. And they always point to congressional over, well, the right way is to go through channels. Well, I can tell you the channels don't exist. The channels to go through your chain of command. Are you supposed to go, to, just think about it in your own life. Are you supposed to go to your boss and tell him, you know, you're doing your job the wrong way. And the guy's saying, oh, yeah? And if you keep saying to your boss, you know, you're doing it the wrong way, and I'm going to tell your boss that you're doing the wrong thing because you're not listening to me. And then you go around and you tell all your coworkers, you know, I'm going to tell the boss of our boss that our boss is really not doing a good job, and I'm going to put it in writing so that everybody knows exactly who I am and you keep doing that, how long do you think you're going to keep your job? How long do you think you're not going to get, they're, they're going to not call the cops on you and take you out in handcuffs from your place of work? That's what, that's what the people in the government are telling whistleblowers to do. Yeah, just go to your boss and tell him that everything he's doing is wrong. We're going to open this up to our audience to ask some questions in just a second, but I want to ask Jim one more question before I do that. Um, as you know, Jim, you're at a university. We have a lot of students in the audience tonight, and some of them are aspiring journalists. Um, do you have any reflections on the future uh, that those uh, folks will be facing and what characteristics they might need to cultivate if they're going to be successful as journalists? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I think I'm, I'm actually much more optimistic about the future of journalism today than I was five years ago. Uh, there's a lot of new outlets. You know, we have, we've, the business has gone through incredible uh, problems uh, over the last decade or so because of the Internet. Um, but it's actually, I think now, you know, we had terrible problems during the recession. But now you're seeing a lot of new online sites and new ventures and a lot of um, people putting money, venture capitalists, trying to invest in new experimental um, uh, news organizations. And so I think it's actually, today it's actually a pretty interesting time to get into the business. And the one thing you, ha you should do, you have to do uh, to get in today is just be as creative and uh, think outside the box as possible. I think you have to, if you really want to be successful as a journalist, you have to be a rebel. You don't want to be, um, you don't want to just go along with the, the mainstream. And that means challenging authority. Yeah, yeah, I, I was telling somebody today, I, I think I've been threatened to be fired by every newspaper I've worked for. So. And you wear that as a badge of honor, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, we have uh, two of our Scylla research assistants here, uh, Casey and Dylan. And they have microphones, handheld microphones. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, please raise your hand. And we do ask uh, that you try to keep it as a question and not a speech, please. <laughs> Oh, it's my turn? Yeah. Um, you, uh, Mr. Kurtzberg, you introduced an idea, and I just wanted to know if you have your own thoughts on who is a journalist. Is it the guy who's writing a blog in his underwear? You know, it's, I think, a difficult question, and a lot of the shield laws get bogged down because they want to try to define it, and they go into great detail. But I think, actually, the courts have addressed this kind of issue in a number of cases that have come up in the shield law, in the, uh, the reporter's privilege context. For me, it matters what your intent was. It may be difficult to determine what your intent was, but if you're gathering that information, and at the time you're gathering it, not after the fact, at the time you're gathering it, your intent was to publish this to a broader group of people 
I think you should be considered a journalist and subject to protections of, of, uh, uh, of a reporter's privilege that in some contexts exist under federal law, in some contexts in jurisdictions doesn't. But I think it really is fundamentally an issue of what was your intent at the time you were gathering the information. In the middle, I guess, there. Actually, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's hard to see with the yeah, light. Yeah, sorry. It's fine. Question for Jim. Um, looking at two, I guess, kind of recent examples, the NSA files and the drone papers from The Guardian and The Intercept, it seems like uh, whistleblower stories are providing the impetus for like this massive multimedia blockbuster journalistic productions. So, two quick questions. Um, why are whistleblower stories provoking that sort of journalism? And second, is it possible for blockbuster journalism to be independent? Uh, you know, I think it's uh, part of the, part of the uh, reason I think people are interested in those stories is because of the danger that the sources face. Uh, it adds kind of a, an edge to the, to the stories. Um, I also think, though, that um, the mass leaks by Snowden or Manning are not, it's not a model for journalism. It's, it's a very unique, uh, kind of uh, unusual and very rare occurrence. And I think one of the things that, uh, what I believe, one of the unintended consequences of the government's crackdown on, leak, on leaks and on whistleblowers is that you've cracked down so much that there's very, you know, most people in the government are, not, are afraid to talk to reporters now. And so you've cracked, you've kind of put a lid on the, on the pot, on the boiling pot of water that used to, you know, used to be, have kind of a normal course of events. A reporter would talk to somebody in the government who was angry about one issue. They would come out, talk to the reporter. There would be a story about the issue that they were angry about uh, after the, they told a reporter about something. And then that person would go back to work. And they would be satisfied that they got the word out about one particular problem, and they would go on with their life and their career. And that was how Washington worked. You would have a whole series of kind of very, uh, you know, uh, you would have a whole series of relationships with people, and they would develop a, they, they would come out, talk to you about something that was ang angering them, and they would go back. Now, the crackdown on leaks has made that very difficult, that normal, organic process of having relationships between reporters and people in the government. And so there's a huge, clamp down on any form of dissent within the government. And I think that's been like a, a lid on a pressure cooker. And so the only people now willing to come out are the people willing to risk their entire life to do it. And there's very few of those people. And I think what they, what's happened is that they realize the consequences of leaking now are so enormous that they take everything. They say, I'm going to get one shot at this. I'm going to take as much as possible. And there, but there's not very many people like that. And I think that's what you've seen with Manning and, and Snowden. And that is not a business model for journalism, and it's not a model for the way that government should work either. Um, I'd just like to know why we have a war on terror when I think the United States government is the greatest terror state in the world. And if, why do we have a national security state when that national security state is so dangerous to the, the entire planet? Well, you should read my book. It's called Pay Any Price. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. This question is for either gentleman or Professor Kirtley. I'm wondering, regarding the lack of support, why do you think America, the American public in general is so willing to relinquish their rights to privacy or their rights to a free press? Well, I'll be happy to let the, the rest of it's, you can hear from me anytime, right? <laughs> I, I, 
Gosh, it's such a broad question, it's hard for me to know where to begin or, or what piece of that you're focused on. Um, I think in the digital age that a lot of people don't understand what privacy rights they are giving up. I mean, I think that a lot of people, the example I like to give is the following. If, if people went to a department store and somebody was following them around with a notebook, writing down, oh, look, he's picking up uh, a shirt, and he looked at it for 15 seconds, and now he put it down, and now he's walking over here, and he's picked up this item, a tie, and he's looking at that for an hour. And, and they had notes. People would say, that's crazy. You can't do that. But they don't think twice about going on Amazon, where statistics are compiled about how much you looked at a tie or a shirt and how long you stayed on it and whatnot. Right? So I think people don't even think about it for the most part. And of course, they don't think about anything in terms of service or click-through agreements of any kind. They, just, they don't even read them. They just click through. So I don't think people give a lot of thought to it, and they don't realize exactly what they are giving up. But the other piece of it, for me, is that for a lot of people, it's worth it to them, right? Amazon, Facebook, a lot of these companies that, that do have these types of privacy issues that get raised provide a tremendous service. That's why they're so successful. People feel that their lives are enhanced by Amazon and Facebook. And so I wonder if, even if they did know the extent of it, that many people would consent anyway. That's my view. And I think the other piece of it is, and this may be you know, part of what your question was focusing on, was why is the public seemingly comfortable with the degree of surveillance, not by the private sector, which Joel was referring to, but by the government and the intelligence community? Why are we content to allow that? Um, and I think the short answer to that question is, that sadly, I think, most people live in sort of a delusional state where they say, the government couldn't possibly be interested in what I'm doing because I don't do anything wrong. And I think there are enough people in this room, uh, probably, who can remember back uh, to a time when people who had joined the Communist Party in the 1930s weren't doing anything wrong then either. But when the McCarthy hearings started in the 1950s, they suddenly found out that it was something very wrong. So for me, the issue is not whether you're being a good, solid, law-abiding citizen today. It's what the government's going to do with that information they collected about you on the future, in the future. And that's all I'm going to say on this, because these are the guys that are here to talk to you today. Well, I think you should all, I mean, one of the things that I think people, as Joel just said, people have gotten used to it because of all of these data, you know, social media organizations and, and online shopping and everything. Uh, but if you look at it from the government's point of view, it's really interesting because they see those as just enormous opportunities. All of those things. One, one of the documents that I wrote about for the Times from, the, from Snowden talked about how it was a memo inside the, the NSA and they said, we are living in the golden age of surveillance and SIGINT, signals intelligence. They see it exactly as you just said. They see it, this is the best we've ever had it because these idiots are doing everything digitally. And I think if more Americans realize that's what the government thinks, maybe they would think, think about it differently. I want to take this opportunity to just ask you a corollary to that, which is, the digital age for journalists seems on the one hand to be a blessing and on the other hand a curse. How is it affecting you in terms of your interaction with your sources as you're doing this investigative kind of reporting? Well, you know, I, I think it's had, well, I don't want to get into all the things that I do. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, there's a debate going on among a lot of reporters that I know and, and the debate is, is this, if, if you, um, one of the things, th there's a big debate about the use of encryption among reporters, and there's some reporters who are real purists on encryption, and they say you gotta do everything encrypted, uh, because that's the only way to um, protect sources. The problem with that is, though, that um, how do you tell someone you've just met in the government that 
you have the following conversation. You, you get, you just met a new government official that you've never met before. You think he might have some information that might be useful, and he wants to talk to you. And you say, you know, it's so dangerous for you to talk to me, you should use encryption. That's not a good conversation to have. That's poor advertising. I think so. And, um, and so a lot of the people, a lot of the reporters who I've heard say, you've got to use encryption, or a lot of journalists, I think, are not investigative reporters. Mm -hmm. They're people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, and the other problem is that uh, I know that the NSA saves encrypted conversations. Yeah, having an encrypted conversation is a red flag. That the NSA saves all encrypted conversations for f some future decryption. And so there's a debate, how best do you do this? And I think the real answer is that you try to meet people in person. So we're back to deep throat in the parking garage? Yeah. A brave new world that we all live in. Um, at this point, I think we have to uh, stop our discussion uh, because we've got a couple of other things to do this evening. And one of them is that uh, copies of Jim's book are for sale outside of this auditorium. So if you're interested in buying a book and having Jim sign it for you, we invite you to go outside and join us out there where we will be in a few minutes. But before I let you go, I want to ask you to join me in thanking both of our lecturers, Jim Rison. <laughs> and